Good evening, and welcome to Chasing the Facts. I'm your host, Sam Chase, and with us this evening is candidate for 14th Middlesex uh, Representative District, Pat Wojcic. And uh, Pat is running for this office on September 6th. That's the date of the primary. Uh, hopefully, everybody has received their uh, invitation from the Secretary of State to take out a uh, mail-in ballot, if that's what they want to do or you obviously have the option of going to the uh, polling place on September 6th and casting your vote. So Pat is running uh, again in the Democratic primary. And just to remind voters of what we're talking about in terms of the district, we have, as a result of the uh, 2020 census, uh, our representative and senatorial state districts have been redrawn. So the new district that Pat is seeking uh, uh, to uh, obtain office for is the 14th Middlesex. And the 14th Middlesex district now consists of precincts 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 in Chelmsford, which is a pretty healthy representation, the entire town of Carlisle, precincts 1, 2, 6, and 7 in Acton, and precincts 1, 2, and 5 in Concord. So uh, a population is roughly uh, 45,500 uh, people, roughly, which is about the size of, of what a uh, representative district is supposed to be. So this is the new district. Pat has decided to run. And so at this point, uh, before we start, though, I'm going to do something uh, which I think might be of interest to voters, is Pat does have uh, some campaign literature. And if Jack, if you can zoom in on that, uh, that would be helpful. This is a flyer that Pat has, and it introduces her to the electorate. And the important thing, I think, the takeaway here is if you want to learn more about Pat's campaign specifically, you can go to Pat's website at Pat Wojtas, that's P-A-T-W-O-J-T-A-S dot com. So more information about Pat's campaign, look that up. So Pat, here you are. And as you've been on the show before, so you know what the drill is, we'd like to have you give us a little bit of a biographical sketch, and then we'll get into the, uh, we'll get into the uh, discussion. Okay. Um, well, the, um, I guess one of the reasons I'm running is because I have been on the, on the Chelsea Select Board for over 13 years now, and I feel like I understand the challenges and the, uh, you know, uh, the language. I understand the language of municipal government, and I think that will be a huge help um, getting started on the first day that I'm elected to the, the House of Representatives. Now, how I got here, um, as you know, uh, when I went to college, I went through ROTC. Um, I, uh, I was uh, commissioned into the Air Force. Second um, lieutenant. As a second lieutenant, <clears throat> yep. And while I was in the Air Force, I, um, they decided that I would be really good at programming computers, so that's what I learned to do uh, in the Air Force. Um, and that served me well because from that experience, from that training I got in the Air Force, it led to a career in technology consulting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, probably you know, 15, 20 years ago, I started getting more involved in municipal government, um, more informed and more involved. I ran for a, a seat on the Library of Trustees, and that kind of whetted my appetite for something a little bit higher. I ran for uh, a seat on the select board, which I, I did win that election, and I've been, um, you know, pretty much on the select board since then. Um, absent you you said couple, 13 years? About 13 years total, yep. Yeah, first year, a little bit of a disclosure here, uh, Pat and I actually served together on the mm -hmm. select board. Uh, I did three years, and my last year, uh, Pat uh, was elected. So we had a year together on the select board, mm -hmm. and um, so... That was in 2007. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that is mm. going back away. Right. Yep. And I have had a couple of small gaps in the, mm -hmm. you know, since 2007, but uh, generally been, um, been very active in local politics since then. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, I think people, most people would understand that uh, as a state representative, essentially representing the interests of uh, local communities, that that particular background is, is, is absolutely 
um, apropos to what you're trying to do. Uh, you said when you started off the conversation here, you, you, taught, you said that you knew the language of municipal government, and that's very, very important uh, to have that uh, background and experience. So that's something I think that you bring to the voters that perhaps your, your opponents uh, don't have quite that experience that you have. Um, I think that's, a, that's a, a definite plus. So let me ask you this. Uh, <clears throat> you obviously could have run before when the districts were differently drawn, but uh, just as a point of curiosity, does the fact that Chelmsford now, uh, that there are five precincts in this particular district, did that in any way uh, inform your decision as to whether or not you were going to run? And maybe if it did, could you explain maybe how that might benefit uh, Chelmsford voters if they if they have you as a representative? Sure. I mean, obviously, it, it did mm -hmm. have, have an impact. Um, you, you may recall that in 2008, I ran um, against Jim Arcero when when Jeff Hall um, retired from. Now that you mention it, I had forgotten it, but I do house. remember. Yes. Yes, and and back then, um, you know, the, that district is all of Westford, all of Littleton, and it was three precincts in Chelmsford. Um, I came in at a disadvantage because mm -hmm. Chelmsford really was the smallest part of, of mm -hmm. that district. Um, I felt like I did reasonably well. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Jim Marcero won, won that election, and he's been our, our representative from that district since then. Now, the Chelmsford is drawn a little bit differently, so I'm no longer in Jim Marcero's district. I'm in the one that right. Tammy Gouveia um, uh, sits right now. And yes, they it, it it's it you know it's five out of the the eleven precincts in Chelmsford are in this district, so it's pretty close to half. It's about half, yeah, yes, yeah. right. Um, so and it's also the the biggest chunk as far as population of the entire district mm -hmm. comes from Chelmsford. Um, as as you mentioned, it also includes Carlisle, Concord, and Acton. But Concord and Acton are also split. So three out of the four communities in this district are split. Um, Nobody likes to have a split district. Uh, it, it, it does impact the effectiveness, I think, of the person that, that's, that's um, elected to the position. But as you also mentioned, having had the municipal experience that I have, I think I understand what all the communities, uh, the challenges of all the communities. Um, I've looked at the, the budgets for all four, and it's interesting to me that um, how, how little help each community gets from the state as far as their budget process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Over 80 percent in every community is um, is uh, burdened. The the burden falls to the residential or the, it's the on real the property estate, tax, property right. tax, mm -hmm. residential land business, um, and, and that's really not sustainable, uh, especially these days when we have when we have inflation and cost of living going up the way it is. We have contracts for our uh, our employees that are that are coming due. Um, we've been pretty good about keeping those pretty flat, around 2% in, in Chelmsford and other communities, but we know that's not going to keep going. I mean, this year, all, all the contracts come due in Chelmsford. Um, there's not any way we're going to be able to settle those for 2%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then having just a two, you know, proposition 2.5, where we don't have, um, I, I guess you could say the luxury, but we don't have the option of increasing taxes significantly, increasing the real estate taxes mm -hmm. significantly. So as salaries go up, as other fixed costs go up, we have less and less for discretionary um, uh, um, features, you know, discretionary benefits that we might have across town, mm -hmm. across the towns. Well, I think the state, and, and again, people probably aren't really aware of the history because it goes back a long time, but I'm 75 years old, so I remember, okay? And when Prop 2 and a half first came in in the late 70s, 1980 era, the deal the state said, the, the, deal, that was, the deal that was made was <clears throat> because of the constraint on the local community's ability to raise property taxes under 2 and a half, the state is going to shoulder some of that burden. And they have, and they did. But what's happened over the years is a lot of these numbers, that, that we, a lot of the hay that we've been getting from the state has been flatlined, mm -hmm. okay, and has not kept pace with inflation. But all of the expenses are driven by the inflationary pressures, as, as you, exactly. as, as you yeah. mentioned. So it is a problem. And the idea was that in a lot of the minds of the politicians, the idea was, well, 
you know, the local communities are funded on based largely on property tax, which some people regard as a regressive, and it is by definition mm -hmm. a regressive tax. There's no uh, progressivity built into that. So, and two and a half is okay because it will limit the growth, but as a result of that, the state allegedly made a commitment that we would fund, in other words, it would come more out of the income tax and from other state revenue sources. Right. Mm -hmm. That hasn't kept pace with the, the cost of, of government uh, providing any kind of municipal services. So, and, and, and it's yeah. not just from it's, it's not just from the income tax too. I mean, you know, supposedly everything from the lottery was supposed to go to correct to unrestricted government aid. And people and, forget that. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and in right. effect, it, the yeah the percentage wise, it has not kept up with inflation. Mm -hmm. And a good a very good example of that is Chapter 90, which goes to the um, you know the maintenance of, of mm -hmm. uh, roads and sidewalks. Um, and that type of infrastructure, I mean, that has been at $200, $200 million for the entire state for like 12 years now. There was one year when they increased it to three hundred. Yeah, we've been flatlined all it's, that time. It's been right. flatlined. Yep. And that doesn't, that doesn't buy what it did 10, 12 years ago, for sure. So in, in Chelmsford especially, at town meeting, mm -hmm. um, the town manager has proposed to, to take some of the free cash that we get every year mm -hmm. and add that to our, our roads and, and sidewalk mm -hmm. maintenance uh, program, which is a good use of those funds. But again, it's not sustainable. I mean, the, the state, especially this year, you know, the, the state has been bragging about how um, income tax revenues are, are just so high, much higher than what they anticipated. Yes. Well, come on, let's share a little bit with that some, with the communities. We're, we're, well, this is the question that the average taxpayer says, where's all this money going? Right. Okay, so as a state legislature, how, later, how, how do you propose to um, address some of these issues uh, should you be elected? Well, I, I, think, I think Chapter 90 is a, is a good example mm -hmm. of that, to, to increase that. Chapter 70, which is the, um, the school's funding, Chapter 70, uh, um, that formula was supposedly reformed in the <laughs> mid-90s, and it hasn't been touched since then. Um, uh, some communities are just so, I don't know, it's, it's unfairly distributed, I guess you could say. If you look at two communities that are, I wouldn't say similar, you know, like Westford and Chelmsford. Westford is actually a more affluent community than Chelmsford, but Westford gets so much more Chapter 78 than Correct. we Correct. So I think that needs to be reconfigured. I mean, I know it's going to be difficult. That's not something that, you know, legislators that come from Westford or the other. I don't think Jim Mosiero is going to want to give up his Chapter 70 money. That's that, right, right, exactly. And, and, that, and you know, folks, uh, that's sad, but let's face it, it's human nature, right? Exactly. I mean, he's got to advocate for the, for the majority of his constituency. Mm -hmm. But you have a situation now where we have a candidate in Pat who actually not that you would give Acton, Carlisle, and Concord short shrift. No, absolutely, I would not. But, you know, you have somebody now that, that really is, can be a little bit more focused on the Chelmsford side of things. And I think that's, that's probably a point in your advantage running in this election, so. Although I will also say, you know, in, in, um, in defense of myself as far as the other three communities, um, I've been a member of the Northern Middlesex Council of Government. Good point, yes. For, uh, since I was first elected to the select board. Can you explain a little bit what that means? Sure, it's, it's a regional planning agency based out of Lowell. It includes um, the city of Lowell and eight surrounding towns, uh, including Chelmsford, Westford, Tewksbury, Billerica, uh, Dunstable, Pepperell, Tingsboro, and I think I got them all, Drake it. Um, and we meet uh, every month <clears throat> and... And you've done that almost the entire time you've been on the board, haven't correct. you? Correct, I have. Yes, yep. okay. Um, we, we, meet, we meet every month and talk about different issues that um, affect the region as a whole and individual communities within the region. And I think I've done a good job of understanding the challenges that the other communities have. I mean, they, the communities range from the city of Lowell, you know, over 100,000 population, to Dunstable, which is what three thousand population, mm. so they have different different needs and different priorities. But I feel like the the the, the agency handles them all well, handles them fairly. Uh, I I was talking with the new executive director uh, just yesterday, and as far as I'm concerned, for the assessment that we pay to that agency, which is just in the, uh, around ten thousand dollars a year we get that back exponentially. And that's the type of um, assistance, I think, that would be good to have throughout the region 
throughout all the other communities that are in mm -hmm. this district. Um, none of the other three are in the Northern Middlesex Council of Governments. They're part of, I think most of them are in the MAPC, um, which is out of Boston, and that's a huge regional planning agency. So those communities being small, I think don't get the attention that they would if they were in a larger, in, in a smaller region like the, like the NEMCOG region. And to your point, uh, Acton and Concord and Carlisle are more affluent communities mm -hmm. than Chelmsford. Sure. So yeah. they're going to, you know, there's going to be less sympathy for, for them in terms of, of trying to uh, mitigate some of the uh, problems that they have revenue-wise. Um, I think that's very important, and of course you and I have known each other for years and we've had this conversation. You know that I'm a huge regional guy, mm -hmm. okay, and I think this system we have in Massachusetts is horribly outdated and outmoded. It was appropriate, you know, 150 years ago when we all moved at three miles an hour and the communication was terrible, but the way things are today, it's hard to justify 351 little kingdoms mm -hmm. all doing the same thing. Right in a small, Massachusetts is a relatively small uh, geographical uh, area for a state, you know, when you look at the other states in the country. And they do things regionally. And, you know, you can argue that maybe the quality of service may not be as good in some cases, but it's certainly a lot more efficient. You get, you, you get benefits of economies of scale, and it's got to sure. be, and I can tell you it's less expensive. My sister lives in Indiana. Now, she gets every municipal type service that we get here in Chelmsford. Everything. Schools, police, fire, DPW, you know, everything. And her property taxes are less than half mm. of what you would get in a comparable Massachusetts right. uh, account. And, I, and, of course, I think their land values may be a little bit lower. But I attribute a lot of that to the fact that a lot of those services are provided regionally and they're not supporting a tremendous bureaucratic mm -hmm. Uh, hierarchy uh, I I to deliver those structures. So, sure. uh, is that something that you, uh, because of your experience on NEMCOG, and I, obviously your interest in that, um, you would look as if you got into the legislature, you would seek ways to uh, address issues that on a more regional basis. Do sure, you think? And, and I've talked for, to, to people in the other communities, mm -hmm. and, and even members of the select board in the other communities that also favor some form of regionalization. Well, that's good uh, to hear. Un unfortunately, I think it has to be done incrementally. Yes. You know, like right now, the, the town of Chelmsford, we have a, an intermunicipal agreement with the town of Tingsboro for animal control officer services. Mm. Um, I mean, that's a very small little thing, but from that, maybe something else could could go forward, maybe even like that's a, a good example, though. Yeah, yeah. Even, even like a jail or something like that. Does every community need to have their own jail when probably Carlisle hardly ever has anybody in their jail? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So why not share something, you know, some services like that across the community? Well, especially that's a good example, especially where we have the Middlesex County. The sheriff's office is local, and that's something that perhaps they could get more involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah, good. That, that's a, I like the example of the uh, animal control officer because uh, in watching your selectmen's meetings, uh, it, uh, I think we heard a report recently that seems to have worked out pretty well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They like it, and yeah. you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't really affect um, how the the coverage is is in mm -hmm. Chelmsford. So that's a good thing uh, because we don't want we don't want that to happen. We don't want to to provide services for another community that then is detrimental to our own mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times there might be something like that, even like sharing equipment, things like that. Mm. DPWs, not every, not every town needs to have a giant bulldozer. Uh, if we could have, right. you know, if we could have one in one of the communities and then shares across four or five other communities, as needed, uh, you know, I'm sure that would work too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, maybe you can't always do it with personnel, but I think with, with uh, you know, facilities. Capital stuff, yeah, capital exactly, stuff, yeah. yeah. No, I, I think, you know, and that's, uh, you, we always have to be mindful, it seems to me, um, those of us who are not, who don't have unlimited income, which is 99% of the population, mm -hmm. you know, we have to be mindful of expenses and so forth, and the perception that many people have about our political uh, system is that the, a lot of money is wasted at the local level and at the state level. Um, I don't happen to think, uh, because of my experience in town, and certainly you, you've had similar experience and longevity, I don't really see that money is wasted 
on the local level. And I, and I would say that that's probably true of most of the suburban towns anyway. Mm -hmm. I think that right. they manage on a pretty tight budget and, and you know, we have a lot of things that we have to do, mm -hmm. right. okay, uh, that we don't have a choice. Yeah, the unfunded mandates. I mean, that's another thing exactly. I'm hearing from so many people. The, you know, to reduce those, I, th I know especially the schools, they have so many mm -hmm. from, from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, but there's, there's some on the, on the towns too. I mean, you know, you had mentioned about uh, voting. Um, you know, one thing is that there's also going to be early voting I, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that will start, I think, uh, the week or so before um, the in-person election. And it's, it's good that we have that. Um, it would be also good if the state would provide some additional funding to cover the cost of that because it's not it's not inexpensive to have no it is not this, the number of people that you need to have to check in and check out and to have uh, you know a patrol officer there to make sure that there's no no dust ups or whatever um, as you know you can have uh, when when uh, people start talking to each other and have very diverse opinions. Oh, does that happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, that, uh, that's, that's, that's a very good point. So anyway, uh, you're elected, and could you identify perhaps a top priority that you would bring into the uh, legislature should you get office? Well, I, I think the top priority is um, a more fair distribution of the funds that the state collects mm -hmm. to the communities, to, to all the communities. I mean, you know, not just Chelmsford. Obviously, Chelmsford is what I know, but, um, you know. What you know best. What I know best. Yes, yeah. right. Uh, but, but even um, Carlisle, Concord, and, and Acton, um, with the way things are going right now, especially some, some of those folks even are having a hard time paying their taxes, uh, their real estate taxes. So. You know, I think it needs to be distributed more more evenly, mm -hmm. and you know, kind of to your point about um, the, the the waste being less at the at the local level. One of my philosophies is, yeah, if something would cost a like, hundred thousand dollars to reconfigure an intersection at the local level, if you bring the state in to do that, it's going to cost a million dollars. That's exactly and right. And if you bring the federal government in, it's going to cost that a million is a, dollars. That is exactly right. So as as <laughs> much as 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 much of those funds as can be distributed to the local governments to let them, because they know best where the need is. Exactly. Um, so that would be my, my number one priority. And then as we also mentioned about regionalization, sharing of resources across mm -hmm. not just this district, but across any community that, that has a need that we might have a resource that, that would be available for, the, for them to use. Um, that's a couple. Um, as far as climate change, I think we're seeing more and more that that's not a hoax. Mm -hmm. um, and there are things that we can do individually, like recycling more, um, you know, t um, using less resources for the things that we that mm -hmm. we do. And then there's other things at a higher level, like um, I think as far as fossil fuel, we need to we need to do everything we can to reduce demand. I think there's plenty of supply. It's just we need to reduce demand. Mm -hmm. um, encourage people to buy more fuel efficient cars, electric mm -hmm. cars. Encourage people to use more public transportation. Mm -hmm. We need to expand a transportation, public transportation network in, in the state. Uh, you know, uh, that's something that really isn't talked about when I hear, when I'm, when I'm watching the political campaigns locally. I don't hear too much about the transportation. If you have people uh, running for office from the city of Lowell, of course, they're used to public transportation in the city of Lowell because they have the bus service. But you get out into the suburbs, fortunately in Chelmsford, we're able to take advantage of uh, uh, of the LRTA. Right, we do have a good. couple of routes that come. But from. Acton and Concord, not so much. And okay. Carlisle, not at all. And Car Carlisle, not at all. So it, it's a problem uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of the suburban communities, and I think that's something that is has been uh, grossly overlooked. So whether or not, however you feel about the climate change situation, um, it's always a good idea to reduce pollution at any level. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And um, so, I, and I think the it's inevitable. I mean, at, at some point, I think the transition is going to be a lot longer than some of our political leaders say it's going to be. Uh, but I, I think, and it's going to, you know, but over time, and hopefully the market will help us with that. Uh, if, if the cost of fossil fuels gets to the point where now it becomes cost-effective to do something else. 
I think that's probably a better generator mm -hmm. than, than the government fiat, if you will. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so it's interesting. So I, I, th I think most people are on board with that. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. like I said, I think it's, it's the encouraging people to, to, you know, with rebates or... Correct. Um, f definitely, you know, trying to do everything you can to, uh, mm -hmm. to lower the prices of installing solar on your homes. Mm -hmm. And we've had those programs in the past. We have. Yeah. Yep. So that's... Uh, yeah, and, and, and in Chelsea, we just, uh, within the past uh, year or so, we've established a sustainability committee mm -hmm. Um, that is working towards making Chelmsford, mm. you know, a net zero community by, by 2050. And it's, it's a tough goal, but... It's a tough goal, but it, it, and, and it may not be achieved. But if you, set the, if you don't set the goal high, you won't achieve anything. Mm -hmm. uh, a, funny, a quick funny story, when I was uh, working in industry years ago, and we were going through one of these quality, you know, education programs that companies like mm -hmm. to do, and uh, so we had to set some goals. And one of the fellows in the group, he says, well, the goal for my group is 75%. Because 100% was just, given his assignment, was, was unachievable. And everybody understood that. But the, the instructor looked and he says, Joe, he says, the goal is not 75%. It's 100 Well, you can't get it. It doesn't matter whether you can get it. It should be the goal. The yeah. goal is 100%, whether it's achievable or not. Right. You're going to work towards 100%. Right. And you know, the little light went off in my head when I heard that, because I'd never really thought about that before, and I thought, my God, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. The goal is always 100%. Right. You know. and, and one thing, so. too, that, that I'll mention, I think we learned a lot from, from mm -hmm. COVID. We learned a yes. lot that we need to do that we weren't doing well before. But then we also learned that we can that we we're, we're resilient. We can we can change quickly if we need to, and you know we change quickly about how we do municipal meetings. We change quickly about how we work. Look at the look at what the schools did. Yeah, look at what the schools. Perfect did. example. Yeah. yeah. So I think <clears throat> maybe we can take some of those lessons and maybe apply mm -hmm. them to. Uh, to some of these other things, like transportation and like the other things having to do with climate change, um, you know, like like regionalization. I I I think there's, you know, um, it's we we can do it. It's just a matter of whether we have the uh, intestinal fortitude, I guess you could say, to <laughs> to follow through on those things. Right. Exactly. And and the notion that I think has always been part of America, at least in, maybe until recently, and hopefully I'm, it's still there. The notion that, you know, at the end of the day, we're all in this together, okay, mm -hmm. and we're not little individual islands, and we do have to work together for common solutions, so, and I've known you for years, and I know that if you are elected, uh, you won't have any problem um, coordinating with your colleagues that may not be of like political mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have any trouble talking to Republicans and, right. you know, and, and people who may be a little bit more conservative than you are to get the solution, so... Um, I think uh, I think you've you've demonstrated that in your past uh, political dealings. So, Pat, we've got uh, about a minute and forty seconds. So I'd like to have you look into the camera, and as you remember, our dear departed friend Dennis Reddy used to say, <laughs> <laughs> "Ask for the vote and tell Chelmsford voters and even Acton and Concord voters why they should why they should support you." Okay, thanks, Sam. So thanks for inviting me uh, today to to talk about my campaign. Um, I am running for the 14th Middlesex District uh, on, uh, for the State House of Representatives on a Democratic side. If you're unenrolled, when you go to vote, make sure you ask for a Democratic ballot or you won't be able to see <laughs> my name on it. Uh, so I definitely want to stress that. Um, I've, I've uh, pretty much lived in Chelmsford all my life, but I am familiar with the other uh, towns in this district. I will do everything I can to improve all of them, um, not just Chelmsford, but I'll, I'll, be, I'll be fair across the board. Um, and one thing I wanted to address is a concern that I've heard recently that um, some uh, members of the community feel that if I were to get elected that I would no longer be on the select board. Well, I just want to kind of address that very quickly. Um, that's not a decision I need to make today. There's a couple of things that have to happen before that would even be a, a discussion item. Um, and uh, if it does happen, it would, I would do what's best for the, for the town of Chelmsford. If I couldn't handle the select board uh, position effectively, then I would, I would resign as soon as, I were, as soon as I were inaugurated to the uh, House of Representatives. 
and that would mean it would not be a special election in the town of Chelmsford to replace me. It would happen during the regular town election that would happen in April of 2023. So if all those things fall into place, but again, I've not given it a lot of thought, um, please get out to vote, either early voting, absentee voting, or in-person voting on September, September 6th. And I respectfully ask for your vote for the State House of Representatives in the 14th Middlesex District. Thank you. Thank you, and that's a wrap. Thank you.